walking, Lord God, in comfort, whether we're walking, Lord God, in good times, whether we're walking in difficult times, and even when we're walking, Lord God, through the valley of the shadow of death, we will bless your name. We will continue to trust you, Lord Jesus. We will look to you, O oh God, because, Lord, you are our God. Hallelujah. And we are the sheep of your pasture. You care for us and you love us, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for the treasure that we have that has, Lord, it, it can't, a price couldn't be put on it, Lord Jesus. And God, as we hear about some of that treasure now from your word, would you open our eyes, the eyes of our heart, open our ears, God, not just to hear, but to get your word deep in our hearts, oh God. Help us, Lord Jesus, we need you, Lord. We give you this time, God, as we open up your word, and we ask, Lord God, that you bless us, oh God, as we hear it. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and the people of God said, amen. Let's give the Lord one more praise offering. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Right now, the children are going to get ready to go to Children's Church, where they're going to hear a wonderful lesson about Jesus while we hear about Jesus over here. Amen. Well, I want to talk to you today about the concept of good. Everybody has their own concept of what good is. For example, when I was a child, I uh, would get disciplined by my father mostly when he wanted me to do good. How many got disciplined by your parents? I mean, you got, I'm not talking about sit in the corner. I mean, you got whacked. Raise your hand. That was me. There was no time out. It was knockout, not timeout. But you know what? He said that he was doing it for my good. I didn't feel that way. I didn't agree with him. But as I look back, guess what? I realize and I learn, oh, absolutely, he was doing it for my good. But we have our own view about good. Right? There are things in place so that we will stay doing good. One of the things we have in place are speed limits. How many know speed limits are good? How many know what it would look like if we didn't have speed limits on the highway or in the streets? Yeah. It'd be like the OK Corral, right? Yeah. So even though I agree that they're good, then why do I put my, uh, my the automatic drive, what do you call that thing? The what? Cruise control. Five miles above it. <laughs> Confession to you. It's my little secret. If it's so good, why do I have to go five miles better than good? <laughs> because even though I know it's good, I really don't like it. I like to go as fast as I would like to go. I was with a brother the other day, and he was doing 80. And I was thinking, oh, so this brother has sin in his life. And uh, I think he said something about his speedometer not working. <laughs> so if the cop stops you, his radar gun wasn't working either. You could just tell him that. Well, anyway, I wanted to get to where we were going, so I was happy that he was doing 80 and sinning <laughs> because it wasn't my fault. I was just an innocent bystander as a passenger. So, you know, he takes all the guilt, and I get to where I need to go real quick. Why do we don't do the things that are good? Did you ever get, <laughs> another confession, did you ever get upset when you're behind somebody and they're doing exactly the speed limit? Right? Why are we upset? They're, doing, they're following the law. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you too much about myself here, aren't I? <laughs> How could they, you know, <laughs> Really, another pet peeve of mine, you know, when you go through those cameras, you know where they are, right? Those, those speed cameras? 
And let's say, you know, you don't go past 30 in those speed cameras. There's a little give on there, but I'm not playing that. I don't want to pay $40. So, and somebody slows down to 20 to go through there. Any, anybody know what I'm talking about? I feel like yelling out the way, hey, you don't get extra credit for going slow. They don't give you money back. <laughs> we have our own concept of good. But I want to tell you, as a matter of fact, I'm not going to ask you to raise hands because I don't want to be embarrassed anybody, but I've asked people in the congregation before, how many of you consider yourself to be good? And, you know, a couple of people raised their hands. They're not ready for what I'm about to say. But Jesus said what? What did Jesus say? Right. Only the Father's good. Nobody's good. So um, our concept of good, I know if I ask that, nobody's going to raise their hand because I just warned you. But a lot of you sit there thinking, I'm not a bad person. I'm a good person. Right? I mean, I don't rob any banks. I haven't smacked anybody lately. <laughs> but compared to what God is talking about, it's a different story. But what I want to talk to you today is about the only one who is good. But he is better than good. He's gooder than good. And if, how many believe that? Raise your hand. That God, if I say God is good, you say? Right. Why is that? Where did that come from? How come people know automatically how to say that? You go to any congregation, say God is good, and you're going to hear back all the time. But that's not how we act, though. We don't live as Christians as if God is good all the time. Because if we did, we would not hear any complaining. How many know what I'm talking about? If God is good, we wouldn't be complaining, right? If he was good all the time, we'd take it like that. But I want to talk to you about that today. I'm going to read one verse. And this verse is repeated over and over in, the, in Scripture. It's Psalm 107.1. I could have taken it from another place. It says this, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. How many have read that in your Bible before? Raise your hand if you've read that in the Bible. Let's repeat it together. Let's say it together. Ready? One, two, three. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. That was 50% of you. The rest of you, everybody. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. If you actually believe that one verse... We say it, if I ask you, you tell me that God is good. If we actually believe that God is good, it would change your life. It would change your perspective. It would change how you react to things. It would change the way you think. It would change the way you talk. It would change your whole outlook on life. That's why it's in Scripture. How many know that a lot of crazy, bad, unfortunate things happen in this life? But we need to know with all those things that we need to deal with that God is good and his love endures forever. How many say amen? amen? Let me tell you what that means for us or what it should mean. Because God is good, you can fully trust him. You can fully trust him. Now, if I asked you, we have these automatic responses as Christians, which uh, in a way... Uh, is, is, is kind of counterproductive. Because if I say, can you trust God, you're going to say? Yes. But we don't live like we do, do we? Because as soon as the first problem comes, or the next one, I should say, we're all anxious, upset, uh, yes, bewildered, any, any adjective you want to put in there. Because if we could trust him if we knew that he was good for real. His goodness allows us to trust him no matter what. It allows us to trust him instead of trusting ourselves. Some people trust themselves. I know people who trust nobody but themselves. How many know people like that? They don't trust a soul, but they trust themselves. That's the most 
foolish thing. Proverbs 28, 26. Those who trust in themselves are what? I didn't say it. But those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. Those who just trust themselves, guess who else they don't trust? They don't trust God. They're trusting in themselves. That's a foolish thing to do. Some people do that. Let's not do that. But his goodness allows us to trust him more than you trust yourself, allows us to trust him instead of trusting people more than you trust him. Some people trust people more than they trust God. As a matter of fact, a lot of the things that we believe in our minds, a lot of them are not true, but we believe them because somebody said it. Right? With all the social media and YouTube and there's videos galore, they can have you believe that their aliens are coming soon. Right? Which goes contrary to what the Bible says. A lot of things. There's a lot of things that people say. And people put stock in it because people said it. But meanwhile, God said something contrary. He said something opposite to that. But we go with what the people said. Not with what God said. How ridiculous is that? The God who made the universe, who made you and me, he created you and me. What he says is. But yet somebody said something, and we're going to put stock in what they said over what God said. Is that insane or what? That shows you the depravity of our condition. Jeremiah 17, 5 says this. This is, this is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. People have turned their hearts away from the Lord, and yet we are listening to what they're saying to us that contradicts what the Word of God says. The Bible says, cursed are those people. This is serious business. Christians are going off the rails because they're listening to what people are saying today and our world is getting more and more depraved instead of what God says. It's amazing to me. Some of the things that I've been shown that people who call themselves Christians post on their social media pages celebrating the sin of the world, what the world says is good, which is evil, Christians celebrating that. Now look, you got me all upset. <laughs> trusting people over God, you're trusting, you're, you're not trusting the God who is fully trustworthy, who never lies, and trusting in people who don't know what they're talking about. His goodness should have us trusting him and him alone. How many say amen? amen? If you know about his goodness, you will trust God beyond what you see. Right? When, when things happen, all we have is our eyes and our, our position in life to see, experience what we are watching in real time was happening. You can't deny what your eyes seeing. Being a Christian doesn't mean make believe you're blind and you don't see what's happening. But trusting God means trusting him beyond what you're seeing. How many of you have ever been short with uh, the rent or mortgage payment or something? What your eyes see is a lack. There's nothing there, right? There, there is, there's not enough. But if we trust God beyond what we see, how many of you can testify and say, God provided and it came from somewhere where I didn't know. I didn't see it, but God showed it to me and brought it to me. Raise your hand. Give God testimony today. Absolutely. The doctor says one thing to you. Well, there's no hope here. Well, you're going to have to live with this the rest of your life. Do you go with that? 
Or do you trust God beyond what you see? That's the whole thing about God. He, he works in the impossible realm. And there's something that we need to have, we need, we need to have more of, which is called faith. According to our faith is what we see. That's why we don't see as much as we should see. Amen? Jesus said to Thomas, blessed are you who see. Blessed are those who believe and who don't see. Amen? If you knew how good he was, how good Jesus was, you would trust him in challenging times. You have to keep reminding yourself. You know, when, when life gets crazy for me or things happen that are not convenient or very troublesome, this is what I actually do, which I'm asking you to do with God's help. Remember that the Lord is good and that his love endures forever. When I find myself in a situation with my back against the wall, oh, no, this doesn't look good, but wait a minute. The Lord is good. And his love for me endures forever. Somehow, some way, God has this thing figured out. How many say amen? amen? If you know about his goodness, you're going to trust God beyond and in spite of your fears. Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4 says this. When I am afraid. How many of you have ever been afraid? Guys, we get afraid too, right? We just don't admit it. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. Why do we put our trust in God? Because he's good. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust and am not afraid, what can mere mortals do to me? Because the Lord is good, we can fully trust him. How many say amen? Amen. Here's another thing that's because the Lord is good. Because the Lord is good, you can reject the lies that the enemy tells you about him. How many of you know the enemy's always in your ear? He's like a mosquito. And he's always telling you things. Things that are negative against God. Hey, God made me a promise. Well, did he really make you a promise? Did he really say that? Oh, you're not going to make it out of this one. Ooh, this is it. (laughs) Well, are you trusting God now? I was reading in uh, in the book of, I believe it was 2 Kings, about uh, when uh, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, they were powerful, almost a world power at that time. And they came to lay siege to Jerusalem. And it was King Hezekiah, I think. It happened to two different kings, Jehoshaphat and, and Hezekiah. And um, he sent his envoys to say, so wait a minute, you think that because you serve God that he can rescue you from my hand? As a matter of fact, your God told me to come and attack you. Read it. You read it in Scripture. And then he says, wait a minute. What, what do you think about the gods of this country and that country? You think their gods were able to save me? What makes you think your God is able to save you from my hand? <laughs> and as you continue to read, it was Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat spread uh, his hands off to the Lord. And he said, look, God, we can't come against this great Horde, you know, uh, God help us. Then God sent Isaiah to tell King Jehoshaphat, he won't, an arrow won't fly in this place. He won't even step foot in this place. I'm going to take care of him. The next morning, that king woke up, and there were 180,000 dead soldiers around him. Nobody shot an arrow. You know what it says? He quietly got up. And he went back to his little country. (laughs) Imagine what he must have been thinking. Oh, I think I, 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 I picked the wrong fight with the wrong God. The enemy lies. 
He'll tell you, God doesn't care about you. How many of you have ever heard that? He doesn't care. Look, look what he's allowing you to go through. Here's the thing I was thinking about. You know, things do happen to us as Christians, right? Let's be honest. It's not a walk through the tulips like some people say. I don't know why tulips. I don't even like tulips. (laughs) But things happen. In other words, bad things happen. And it makes you feel like God doesn't care when that's the total lie. How could the God who came to earth and gave his life to save you and me, to wipe out our sin by his own precious blood. You mean he did all of that and now all of a sudden he doesn't care? He well, okay, done, bye. Lots of luck. Makes no sense, right? But when you're in trouble, you're not thinking clearly. We have to remind ourselves that the Lord is good and his love endures forever. Let's say it again. The Lord is good and his love endures forever. Forever. Psalm 56 8. Listen to this. You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. God cares so much about you. Everything that you go through, every tear he collects, not one falls to the ground that he doesn't know about. He loves you. Beyond what you can imagine. Here's another lie. He's not listening to you. You're praying and you're not seeing the answer. We read in the book of Daniel about Daniel was praying and it, the, the answer was delayed 21 days. And then he was speaking to the angel. The angel appeared to him and said that he was he was being opposed by dark forces. But it said, as soon as your prayer left your lips, God sent the answer. How many know that God's answers are sometimes delayed, not because he wants you to suffer more, but because time needs to pass for that thing to make sense? I mean, it's hard to see it going forward, but when you look behind your life and you you see God's fingerprint all over it, and, I, you know, there have been times that I've been in a tough spot and it, it's lasted longer than I'd like. And then God brought me out and then I look back and I say, that needed to happen exactly the way that it happened for me to learn what I needed to learn and for me to be where I'm supposed to be emotionally, spiritually, in my maturity as a Christian. It needed to happen just like God made it happen. But when we don't hear and we, we think delay or not a, here's what, here's what we really mean when we see God didn't answer. You know what we really mean? God didn't say yes. That's what we mean. Guess what? There are other answers other than yes. How about this one? No. That oh, God didn't answer me. Yes, he did. He said no. Why? Because you would destroy yourself with it. God, if I could only hit the lotto. No. You're not going to beat the one in 10 billion odds. <laughs> Why? Because you'll, you'll walk away. You'll destroy yourself. You'll destroy your faith. A lot of things. That's a ridiculous uh, uh, analogy. But a lot of things that we pray for, do we want God's answer or not? Do we want God's way or not? Or, or are we really telling God what to do with our lives? Here's what I want, God. Would you put your stamp of approval on it? Stamp of approval. Well, I don't want his stamp of approval if what I'm asking is going to ruin my life. How about you? God does answer. He is listening. Isaiah 65, 24. I will answer them before they even call to me. While they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. Everybody here who's had more than one answered prayer, would you raise your hand? If you didn't answer, if you didn't raise your hands, because you never prayed. 
Because you know that God answers prayer, don't you? If you know that God answers prayer, say amen, a loud amen. amen. So then why do we listen? How many have heard that? God's not listening. How many have heard that in their heart, or that the devil's saying that? Raise your hand if you've heard that. Don't go with it. Don't, not even for a second. Not even for a second. Don't give him that time of day. Here's another one of his lies. He's angry with you. He's angry with you. So why a lot of people don't take communion on, on communion Sunday. Why? Because God's angry with you. Why is he angry with you? Because I messed up. God doesn't get angry. He's concerned about you. He gets angry at the sin that's destroying you, but he's not angry at you. And if you ever do sin, who can tell me what you're supposed to do? Who can say the verse? Anybody? First John 1 9. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what you do immediately. And guess what? Ready? It's done. Under the blood immediately. Do you, does it sound too good to be true? God is too good but true. Not too good to be true. He's good and true. How many say amen? amen. Here's another one. He's left you alone. You're all alone. God is far away. Why is that a lie? Because he said that he would never leave you alone. <laughs> but we believe it, don't we? You know how many people I've counseled with that tell me that? All these lies that I've just outlined, people tell me that. For the moment, they're blinded into believing. Because you know who we're, I, I want to say messing with. I don't mess with Satan. I don't have to. Jesus already took care of him. Right? I, I, I don't... I don't need to deal with him one-on-one -on -one except rebuke him in the name of Jesus. That's it. I don't talk to him. Jesus, take, take care of that for me, please. Right? The one that he trembles at, the name. That one. That, that's who I want speaking up for me. He tells you that God has left you alone. Hebrews 13, 15 Interesting verse. It says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Why? Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. I was thinking, why do those two things, why are those two things before that? Because a lot of times we're lacking money. We're unhappy that we don't have more money. And we're not content. And then the enemy comes and says, look, you don't even have enough to support yourself. God has left you alone. So let me read the verse again. Hebrews 13, 15. Keep your eyes, your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said. Let's read that together. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Read it again. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Why is that? Because God is good all the time. He's good. How many say amen and give him praise this afternoon? And let me give you this last thing before I close. Timmy, if you'd come. Because of the fact that the Lord is good, you can hold on to hope during dark times. Dark times are not fun. Dark times are dark times. It's a struggle. To test your faith. I love what David said. I needed to hear God inspired David through his Holy Spirit to write for me that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you 
are with me. And we just read that God will never leave us or forsake us. There is no place that we can walk through that God won't be with us. How many say amen? Listen, you know why you can hold on to hope? Are you a little logical? Do you need to analyze things, have a little problem with faith? Let me tell you this. God has a track record. He has a track record. I, I was thinking about even people who say that this word isn't true. There's a track record in here. There's proven facts. In other words, prophecies that have been fulfilled. Jesus was prophesied about. It happened exactly as was prophesied. They talked about that he would suffer. Who could figure that out? Who, who would think that God would come down here and suffer? Said that he would ride on a donkey. Said he would be a man of sorrows. God has a track record. Not only in the word, but he has a track record with you. He has a good track record with you. You know, I was thinking about, we forget that God is good when we go through trouble, but you know when we sing that song, um, Goodness of God? How does that go, son? Uh, all my life you have been faithful. Sing a verse there, or a chorus, whatever. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will see Of the goodness of God You know, sometimes as I'm playing the bass and we're singing that I can't hear that without tearing up because God has a track record with me. And the awesome thing about that statement, the reason I tear up is because I have not been so good. That's what gets me, see? God is good all the time. And if I look back at my life, my track record wasn't good. Yeah, God has cleaned me up, but guess what? I... I I, I, I'm humble before the Lord because he was good to me when I wasn't good. How many can testify he's been good to you even when we weren't good? Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Can somebody agree with that in your own life? Raise your hand if God can be trusted, if God has been faithful to you. His track record happens to be perfect. It's perfect. I love that one line in the song that we do. I forget the name of it. But it says, I don't know what you're doing, but I know what you've done. That's the story of my life. But see, now, because I know that God is good, and I don't, I, I, I'm not questioning that, I don't know many times what God is doing. But that's okay. You know what? I don't need to know anymore. All I need to know that he's with me. That's all. You're with me? Good. You're going to walk with me in the valley of this shadow of death? Good. Okay, I'm good. Just keep me. As long as you're with me, I don't need to know. Just, just show me where to go. Before I had questions. Why? Where are we going? How come this? How come? Done. I'm done. He's proven himself too many times. I don't know how he works. It's how could I understand how God works? It's miraculous. How do you understand a miracle?
but what he's done in my life has always been good. That's my testimony. How about you? Because of his track record, you can be encouraged in extremely difficult circumstances. I was reading about David. You remember David, the best king that Israel ever had, the most powerful, the wisest, the one who loved God the most. And there was a time when he went through some stuff. And he had been running from Saul, wound up camping out with the Philistines, the enemies of Israel. And they led him. And he was going to go out to fight against the Israelites. I don't know what the story was there. The Bible doesn't say. I don't believe he would actually fight against the people of God. But anyway, they were on their way. But the commanders in the king's army said, I'm not going with that guy. That's the guy that that hit song came out about. The number one hit song. Saul has slain his thousands, but David has tens of thousands. Who do you think the tens of thousands were? That was us. If he goes, we're not going. So the king had to say, look, I trust you, but the guys won't go. You're going to have to go back. And when he went back, you know what happened. The town had been burnt down. I think it was the Amalekites, one of the ites. And not only did they burn the town down, they took every woman, every child, every possession. Think about it. David is running for his life. He's with these band of rejects, really. That's what they were. Run away from Saul. About 600 of them. And they are crying. They're weeping. Imagine you go home and your family's gone. Your stuff is gone. Your home burned to the ground. So they got so upset, they started talking about stoning David. Talk about being alone. Talk about everybody rejecting you. But we read this. 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter and spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. You know why he found strength? Because he knew that the Lord was good. The psalm that we read, Psalm 107, one that we've repeated numerous times now, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. Guess who wrote that? David did. And he also wrote this, Psalm 34, verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. When he was talking about, when the Bible says that he was strengthening himself in the Lord his God, what he was reminding himself of was that God is good. And he was at that moment taking refuge in the goodness of God. Knowing that if he ran to his God, knowing that if he ran to him, God would bring him through. Why? Because God is good and his love endures forever. You see, somehow, God mixes the bad ingredients of your situation, of your trouble, and he makes something good out of it. You know, I was trying to look up online if there's any way that you could take bad ingredients and make something good and tasty out of it, and I couldn't find anything. It's not possible. You have to have good ingredients. You can make uh, t mix something that doesn't taste good with a lot of good stuff. And maybe, you know, it gets mixed in there. But you can't take bad ingredients and have something good pop out of the oven. Unless you're God. Because he says that we will know, well, Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes, I love that next word. What's that next word? Everything. Everybody say that together. Everything. God causes 
everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. How does he do that? I know he's done it in my life. He's done it over and over and over again. He's taken bad ingredients of circumstances in my life and somehow he made something good about it. I don't know how he does it, but I just know that he does. How many can testify God has done that for me too? Raise your hand high. Give God glory. And I want to close with this. Here's why you can trust him. Here's why he's good. Because while you would be satisfied with good, God is always going for the greater good. We'd be, okay, just give me good. No, 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 I, not good. I have greater good for you. Here's what Ephesians 3.20 says. It talks about that. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. We don't ask for enough. I'm not talking about greedy stuff, like God make me a millionaire. I'm saying we don't believe God for enough. But God takes sometimes our little prayers with the little mustard seed of faith that we can work up. And he turns it into something way beyond that what you were asking. Who can testify about that? Would you raise your hand and testify to God? The Lord is good. What are you going through today? What did you come burdened with here today? What has the enemy been whispering in your ear? You have to know that the Lord is good. Because if you know that, you'll make it through this. God's going to bring you through, not just making it by the skin of your teeth. Here's what he does. Ready? Not just a victory, more than a conqueror. More than. See, how many would love to just conquer? Wouldn't that make you happy? To make... We're conquerors. Oh, no, no, no. That's not enough for God. More than a conqueror. More than enough. He lavishes his love on you and me. He is good. And his love endures forever. If you're going through something, remember that. Write it on, 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 on a something and put it up on your refrigerator plaster your house with it so that you won't forget the next time you're going through something or if you're going through something right now remember God is good he'll he'll bring you through let's bow our heads he works things together for those who love him and are called according to his purpose that means you have a relationship with him. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, for whatever reason, and God is speaking to your heart, you want this God who's good to be with you in the valley and everywhere else you go, I want to invite you to receive him as your Lord and Savior or to come back to him if you walked away. Those of you at home, I'm going to make the same invitation to you. If God is speaking to your heart, you're in a place but he has not been your Lord and Savior. I'm inviting you to make him your Lord and Savior today. If you're here and you want to pray the prayer of faith with me to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, raise your hand. I will see it and I will pray with you. Yes, I see your hand. Anybody else? I see your hand. Yes. Anybody else? Anybody else before we pray? I see your hand. I see your hand. Those of you at home, would you raise your hand? God will see it. By faith, raise your hand. Don't worry if there's nobody there. If you're with people, it doesn't matter. Raise your hand. Yes, I see your hand here. Thank you. I see your hand. I see your hand. Thank you. Amen. If you raise your hand, you could put it down. If you raise your hand, I'm going to say a prayer. Just repeat it after me. God will hear it. Make it your prayer to God. I'm going to give you the words to help you out. 
but God will hear it as yours. You at home, you do the same thing. Say this, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for speaking to my heart today. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. You are God in flesh, the Messiah. I believe that you came to die on the cross for the sins of the world and for mine. And I also believe that you rose on the third day. I believe that tomb is empty. Jesus, I also know that I'm a sinner. I've done a lot of things wrong. And today I'm asking you to forgive me. Wipe all those sins away with the blood that you spilled on the cross. Today I'm giving you my heart. I'm surrendering my life to you in Jesus' name. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for those that have invited you in to be Lord and Savior of their life. I pray, God, that there will be, God, a revelation of who you are in their lives right now. Lord, according to your word, right now, not later, no qualifiers, God, right now they are your children. They are in the family of God, and I thank you for that. I pray, Father, that you would guide them from here into next steps, oh God, into knowing more about you. Guide them, Lord. Help them, Lord God, as they begin to read the Word, the Bible, oh Lord God, that, that you would give them understanding, Lord Jesus. God, wrap your arms around them and protect that seed that was planted, Father. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. With our heads bowed and eyes still closed, you're a Christian here. You're going through something. And perhaps for a moment, you might have been listening a little too long to the enemy's lies. And today you want to confess God is good in your life. You know, it's good to confess that when we're going through something. God comes in greater ways. Would you raise your hand? I just want to pray God's blessing over you. Raise your hand. I see your hand. Raise your hand high. If you're going through something, you need a special dispensation of the grace of God. Yes, I see your hands all over the building. Father, thank you. You see these hands from your children raised up to you, Father. God, they know, they confess with me that you are good and that your love endures forever. I pray that you would surround them with the goodness of God. I pray, Father, that they will see, Lord God, Lord, beyond what they can see with their physical eyes, God, with the eyes of faith, knowing, Lord Jesus, God, that you are right there with them, God. You have not forgotten about them, Lord God. You are hearing them, Lord God, and you are already working things out to the praise and glory of your matchless name. There's no way, oh God, that you're not going to answer and that you're not going to deliver and that you're not going to provide and that you're not going to heal, Father. But Lord, give them the faith that they need right now. Lord, in desperate times, Lord, you come in greater ways, Lord Jesus. Father, when we need you the most, Lord God, you show up in amazing ways. I pray, Father, that you, your presence will be with your people who need you right now, oh God. You are so good to do that, Lord. Let those everlasting arms of yours, O oh God, Lord God, continue to support and raise up your children as we continue to put all of our trust in you. Father, I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Can we all stand and can we give God praise because he is good and his love endures forever. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.